Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Very good. Okay. So I just realized I'm going to be in the movies. It's going to be a DVD is going to be made about me. I'm going to be in the movies. Wow. I'm so excited. Um, I've been doing this work for 29 years, which sounds to me like a really long time, making me feel really old. Anyways, so the president of our corporation has always, there we go, president has always said that he hopes that the letters behind his name sometimes spell something. I don't know that that's ever going to happen, because I don't know any certification I can get that's got a U in it. Anyways, I try and keep this light. We're a relatively small group, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand. If I'm facing the screen and I don't see you, please call out. Say something nice about me, please. Um, also, if you would silence your cell phones and such like that, I'd appreciate that as well. So the first time I did a mold presentation was to a group of my peers, a group of other certified industrial hygienists, about 15 years ago. And yes, I started the presentation out with, I'm the fun guy who does fungi. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're in a laughing mood. I try and keep it light. I try and keep it lively. So laugh at the bad jokes, because they don't really get much better. And speaking of bad jokes, Lore of the Wild. Although less well known than his brother Johnny, Jimmy Fungus Bore reached the Pacific Coast on this day in the 1820s. Okay. All right. So we are going to talk about mold today, and you will know more than you ever wanted or cared to know about mold at the end of this session. Mold and fungi awareness. So fungus is a kingdom, along with bacteria, plants, and animals, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute or two. And it includes mushrooms, which are multicellular, yeasts, excuse me, yeasts, which are single cells, rusts, mold, and smut. These are all synonyms for similar things. Now, that mildew stuff you have in your bathroom, that we all have in our bathroom, guess what, folks? It's just another word for mold. That's all. So when you think you don't have mold in your houses, that's one of the places you do. I will point out a few others that all of us have mold in our houses. So what is the study of microbiology? Well, microbiology principally includes the study of bacteria, fungi, and viruses. It also includes single-cell animals such as amoeba and other things with flagellums that help them propel themselves. We cavorting beasties, they were once called, when the first person saw them under a microscope. Other normal indoor allergens. So we're talking about this from an indoor air quality concept as well. So I have included these are other typical indoor allergens that you see out there. So dander, which are skin cells. There are our skin cells and other pretty much animal skin cells. So I have just left a couple of million skin cells in the air and on the floor of this theater. Pollen, animal hair, insect parts, insect feces, Dust mites and arachnids, these are all part of what surrounds us on a constant basis. So let's see how you react to this. The other two groups were less than amused. Right now, there are literally thousands of dust mites eating the dead skin cells in your eyebrows. That is the way life is. They are constantly around us. What is a bacteria? Well, a bacteria is a single-cell prokaryote, no-nucleus living organism. It is the most simple of living organisms on this planet and is the basis for all life. Many, most diseases are caused by bacteria, primarily gram-negative bacteria, and environmental bacteria include Legionella, which you get from cooling towers. I assume everyone's heard of Legionnaire's disease. Well, the causative agent Legionella pneumophilia causes actually two diseases. It causes Legionnaire's disease, which doesn't affect large numbers of people in a population, but it kills a high percentage of those people who acquire the disease. It also causes Pontiac fever. We don't understand why it causes the two different diseases. Pontiac fever affects a large number of people in a population, but doesn't kill anybody. We don't understand the differences, but that's what that causative agent does. Escherichia coli, 
better known as E. coli, which you get from sewage backups and from recall of contaminated meat stuffs when they slaughter an animal and they accidentally pierce the intestinal tract and release feces into the meat. And Staphylococcus aureus in hospitals. Has anybody ever heard of MRSA? Okay, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So methicillin is one of the most potent antibiotics that humans make and Staphylococcus, there's a strain of Staphylococcus aureus that is resistant to it. So those are some of the more important environmental bacteria. What is a virus? A virus is a small, it's not actually a living organism outside of a host. It needs a host. It's a small package of either DNA or RNA that takes over your cell your cell's mechanisms to create copies of itself. The purpose of any living thing on this planet is to make copies of ourselves. That's what we do. That's what every living thing does. And that's what viruses do. And they do it by taking over your cell's functions. Primary examples of viruses are chickenpox, common colds, influenza, and AIDS. Now both chickenpox and AIDS are what we know as retroviruses in that they stay in the body for long periods of time. Chickenpox then reappears as shingles. What is a fungus? Again, it's of the, again, of the kingdom of mycota, which is the Latin word for it. And again, includes mushrooms, yeasts, which are single cell animals or single cell uh, items, rusts, which are plant pathogens, molds and mildew, which are multicellular, Smut, which are, again, plant pathogens, they are characterized by the absence of chlorophyll. Now, what that means is, is they are not green plants. Plants are a different kingdom and produce their own energy and their own food materials. Fungi are saprophytic, like us. They need to eat dead organic material. Okay, so they always need a food source. They also have a dimorphic reproduction cycle, which means they can either reproduce, reproduce sexually or asexually. Now they don't actually have little boy and little girl fungal cells. They have sort of positive and negative, they sort of call them. But they do swap DNA. I guess that means they swap spit too. Come on folks, that was funny. Come on, come on. Thank you. I'm a frustrated comic. Anyways, so, or they can reproduce asexually, which means that the daughter or child cell is DNA equivalent to the parent. Okay. And again, the whole point of any living thing is to make copies of itself. And this, of course, is lovely mold. One caveat, all of the pictures of mold in this present, excuse me, none of the pictures of mold in this presentation were taken at this college. What is a fungal spore? A fungal spore is merely a seed. That's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, I take that back. It is also a hibernative state. So the seed can exist and we don't know really how long a fungal spore will last. Bacterial spores we know last thousands of years. How do we know this? Because remember the curse of the mummies when researchers went into tombs and found in the early 1900s and found all the treasures of several of the pharaohs and then the researchers died? And the Egyptians thought it was the curse of the mummies? No, it was anthrax spores that had been in those tombs for thousands of years waiting for a new host. Now, we know that fungal spores are not as resistant as bacterial spores to aging, but they still are a hibernative state and still last an extended period of time. So spores can be culturable, what we call culturable, which means they're alive, which means under the right circumstances, which we'll talk about, they will grow into the vegetative state. They can be non-culturable spores. In other words, they're dead. They won't grow under any circumstances. But that doesn't mean there's no health risk from them. Spores are ubiquitous. Ubiquitous, a big fancy word meaning everywhere. So in the ambient environment, outside, in a cubic meter of air, does everyone understand the metric system, how big a cubic meter is? Well, a cubic meter is around a cube around 39 inches on all sides. That's a cubic meter, as a meter is about 39 and an eighth inches. So in every cubic meter, there are some, either five, somewhere between 500 and 5 to 10,000 spores per cubic meter of air. 
And that can fluctuate wildly. You can sample in a location and get 500, and an hour later sample at that exact same location and get five or 10,000. Additionally, it's a very dynamic environment. And the first hour, you could have fungal spore A as the most prominent, in other words, about 80%, 70 or 80%, and fungal spore B at 10%. The next hour, it can be completely opposite. Fungal spore A can be 10%, fungal spore B can be 70 to 80%. So it's a very dynamic environment out there, and it fluctuates wildly, and there's lots of spores out there. So other structures in the fungal world are hyphae, mycelium, and conidia. These are the three main other structures, and what we call the structures of reproduction. So spores are ubiquitous. If I were to take a swab of someone's glasses in the audience, the dirt that's on your glasses would likely have one or two fungal spores present. Hyphae, mycelium, and conidia are those growth structures. So when the spore germinates and starts to grow, they produce these structures. Loosely translated, they would be root, stem, and flower. So this is Aspergillus fumigatus. It's a fairly common fungus. It is also the causative agent of a disease called aspergillosis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this would be the conidia. This is likely the mycelium. And this is likely a hyphae. So the conidia being the flower, where more spores are formed. Hyphae being a very small tube that fungal growth used to send moisture and nutrients and enzymes back and forth throughout the growth. And hyphae, I'm sorry, mycelium, are mats of stacked up hyphae. There are other structures, but those are the three primary structures that you'll need to know, or that you'll even care about. So this is bipolaris, which is a different genera. So let's go back. There we go. So every living thing on this planet has two names. So we are Homo sapiens. That's right. Homo being our genus name or genera, there were other homo genera out there. There was Homo erectus and maybe one or two others, I assume, if a science person could help me. Uh, and sapiens would be our species name. So in this situation, Aspergillus is the genus, Fumigatus is the species. So here we have a genus only, Bipolaris. Again, this would be hyphae or mycelium. And this is an ascus, which is where spores are formed in this type of a fungus. There are multiple different types. They form spores in different areas. Uh, this is cladosporium, which is by far the most common fungal type out there. This is penicillin. So again, this is the conidia, and this would be the hyphae or mycelium. Now when they originally started naming these things, they named them for what they look like. Penicillin, in Latin, actually means paintbrush. So doesn't that look like a paintbrush? And this is Catomium. I'm sorry, it's off on the bottom. This is Catomium. So this is a completely different looking structure. And this is pretty much how they identify these things. They look at them under a microscope. It takes a trained person to know what they're looking for. This is the poor, dreaded, toxic mold known as Stachybotrys. Stachybotrys chartarum. I assume you've all heard of black toxic mold. Guess what? When molds grow, most of them are black. Environmental and economic importance of fungi. So people have said to me when I've been doing consulting for them, well, can't we just get rid of all the fungi? Yeah, no, you can't do that. Principally, the main uses of fungi are they are a dec primary decayers of dead materials, principally cellulose in our environment. Without fungi, trees and plants in the natural environment would never decay. The nutrients that they are made up with would never be recycled back into the environment and used again. They are very important for that. They are very important in the production of various chemicals and foods, including alcohols, cheese, bread, antibiotics. Every antibiotic that you take is a fungal toxin. Absolutely every one. Now, you might ask yourself, why do fungi create these lovely toxins if they're nasty chemicals? Well, not all fungi grow at the same rate, just like people. Some people grow slow, some people grow fast. 
So if you're a slow growing fungus, you need a competitive advantage because something else has already taken over the environment. And there's such a little piece of the pie you want to take over. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you're a slow grower, you have to create something to help you. So you create a nasty chemical to kill everything else in the environment except you. They are doing, we surmise, chemical warfare at their level. That is what fungal toxins are for. And mushrooms, of course, are, are fungi. What do funguses need to grow? Well, I don't have every, quite everything up here. I forgot one or two things. So they need oxygen. Ah, plenty of oxygen in our environment for them. Uh, they need a food source. We talked about that before. Pretty much any organic material will suffice. They will find a way to grow on it. They do prefer cellulose. They do prefer starches. But they can pretty much grow on anything. Cheese, bread, just about anything. Uh, they need water. Water can be in the form of leaks, drips, relative humidity. Has anybody ever lived in the Gulf Coast or eastern seaboard of this country? No. Okay. I have a story. I'm full of stories. You might say I'm full of it, but I'm full of stories. Thank you. So my father-in-law, who grew up in California, was stationed in the, it was in the Air Force in the 50s and was stationed in Florida. And he got to Florida, and some of the people who he knew said, oh, you need to turn the light on in your closet or you'll grow mold on your leather shoes. And he went, ha, 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 you people don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, they did. <laughs> he did not keep the light on in his closet, and he grew mold in his shoes. Because of the relative humidity of the environment on that area of our country is extremely high. And that's all fungus need. Somewhere between 60 and 70 percent relative humidity will be enough for fungal spores to germinate. Now you might ask yourself, what were they eating in issues? Well, leather is an organic material. That's what they were eating. The base material doesn't even need to be organic. Several years ago, I was doing consulting in a house, standing and looking at the sliding glass door, and at my eye level, there was a two-inch diameter fungal colony growing on the glass of the sliding glass door. Glass is not organic. It wasn't eating the glass. There was dirt on the glass. These people kept their house closed up and constantly were boiling water on the stove. And they had lots of people living in the house, more than were it was designed for. So there was lots of excess relative humidity in the house. That relative humidity, coupled with the dirt that was on the sliding glass door, allowed that fungal growth to occur. They are amazing little creatures and will find a way, if it's possible, to grow. They like a comfy room temperature, like we do. They don't like it too cold, they don't like it too hot. There's one other thing here they don't like much. They don't like sunlight. Think of mushrooms. They like the shade. Think of moss growing on the north side of a tree where there's shade. They don't like sunlight. Facts to consider during a clean water intrusion event. Okay? So one of the things I do want to stress is at the bottom here, depending upon the size of the water intrusion event, some or all of the above items need to be utilized. Not all of them. It depends upon the size. So if you have a ceiling tile that gets dripped on by a small pipe leak or a small roof leak. Well, you don't need to go through all of these steps to do that. You need to seal up the pipe or seal up the roof and replace the ceiling tile. It's an extremely easy process. However, if you've had a supply line to the sprinkler systems burst and you have thousands of gallons of water now in an environment, well, then most of these things you're going to need to do. And that would include you have about 72, somewhere between 8 and 72 hours to get the drying process started before fungal growth will begin to occur. Take some time. You want to remove the water as quickly as possible. Begin the drying process. Bring in fans, bring in dehumidifiers. You want to lift the carpeting and install fans and dehumidifiers. Gosh, I just said that. And maybe, depending upon how wet it is, you may need to dispose of the carpet pad. You might be able to save the carpet. If walls become wet, you may need to remove the baseboard and coving and install wall air movement equipment and air heating equipment into the wall to dry it out. Sometimes people just remove the lower portion of the wall and blow in air then and then repair it later on. 
You need to evaluate the moisture levels using a moisture meter, a psychrometer, or a thermometer to make sure all porous materials are dried out. And most importantly, of course, you need to identify what caused the water intrusion event and you need to solve that. So this is a clean water, which would be akin to potable water, water that we drink. So this are the factors to consider in a black water event. Well, you might be asking yourself, what is black water? Well, I'll be happy to tell you. So everyone's familiar with a trap underneath your sink or in a floor drain? Well, that trap stops sewage, sewage vapors from coming up into the room, which is why when you walk into a bathroom and you go, phew, it smells in there. Well, if you just pour water into the trap, it will, because the trap's probably dried out, it will keep that sewer gas from coming back up. If the water comes from after that trap, that's considered black water and likely has lots of viruses and bacteria in it. So in that situation, you likely need to dispose of most fabric materials. You need to dispose of carpeting and the pad. You need to remove the lower wall sections if they've been affected. You need to dis clean and expo the exposed interior wall cavities and you need to disinfect everything. Now again, this all of course depends upon the size of the event. So if we had like a small toilet backup onto some carpeting or onto the floor, you wouldn't necessarily need to remove all the walls and such like that. However, if you had your sewer main backup throughout your house and deposit three inches of sewage into your house, then yes, you're probably doing all of these things. Each situation is dynamic and each situation needs different res responses and, different, and will get different results. Factors to consider. So you want to look for evidence of water leaks. Uh, any brownish water staining on ceiling, wall, ceiling, drywall, or below roof leaks, it may be indicating you've got a roof leak. Now, just because you have this brown staining, does that mean you have fungal growth? Nope. No, it does not. Depends on how long that material stayed wet. Depends upon if there's actually live fungal spores at the location. I didn't do it. I'm not, it's not my fault. It's a dynamic situation. So just because you have a water intrusion event doesn't necessarily mean you have fungal growth. You want to look at water stains on the underside of a wood roof, water stains adjacent to or below windows, corner joint stains at leaking windows, water stains below sinks, mineral deposits or corrosion on plumbing lines or water heaters, stained carpet tack strip below windows, next to sliding glass doors or showers. We'll talk about showers in a minute. Buckled wood flooring, stained linoleum next to toilets or plumbing, overwatered plants. So now I'm going to get on my, um, on my high horse here. How many of you like indoor plants? Show of hands. Yeah, I hate them. Hate them. Because, let's say, especially in an office. So this gentleman walks by a plant, sorry for picking on you, and he sees it looks dried out. It's weak. Leaves are tipped over. You need a drink of water. He gives it a drink of water. Then this young lady comes by and does the same thing. Then the lady, young lady next to her comes and does, does the same thing. So pretty soon we have an overwatered, diseased plant creating bacteria and fungus in an environment. Another story, we were doing a mold consulting project in a fairly large building in LA. And we did sampling throughout the building. And in one area, we found a problem. Couldn't understand why. We went, we looked through that whole building, that whole area, did moisture meter readings, nothing was wet. There was no evidence of fungal growth. So then I started looking at the plants and I found one fairly large plant, about a two inch diameter, about a three foot high plant. Then I realized it was two pots, an inner one and an outer one. I lifted the inner pot. There was three inches of disgusting black water on the outer pot, just standing there. Smelly, causing fungal growth and bacterial growth in that water. That was our problem. So I and people in my industry typically do not like interior plants unless you have a service and it's their responsibility and no one else touches those plants. Not a big fan of plants. Uh, and observable, unusually dark fungal growth on exposed surfaces, obviously. Other factors, so you want to look for elevated levels of relative humidity. So again, above 60 to 70 percent, i.e. the eastern seaboard Gulf Coast, are very typical and have lots of fungal problems. Overwatering of vegetation, either exterior walls or interior plants. 
Condensation and growth inside of buildings, throughout the building, paper or on glass, showers, boiling water. Subterranean plant growth, moisture in crawl spaces. Algal cell growth on stucco. So typically, if you go and you see a building and it has a green or blackish looking growth on the outside of that building, and you might think it's mold, likely it's not. Likely it's algal cell growth. Because again, molds typically don't like sunlight. Also, to my knowledge, there are no known health risks caused by algal cell growth. This is the inside of a window in the living room of an apartment. I don't know why I chose C, but I did. I drew that in the humidity that had played it out, the condensate on that window. Again, they never open their windows and doors to vent the humidity that's in the, in the residence out, and they did lots of boiling of water. There's also another producer, large producer, of relative humidity inside of buildings. Anybody care to take a guess at what that is? Person. Person. That's right. We. So when you go outside and it's really cold and you go, oh, and that steam comes out of your mouth, that's not steam. That's humidity. And it's cold outside and that condenses so you can see it. That's what we exhale every time we exhale. Lots of humidity. We also exhale lots of other chemicals, including acetic acid and a variety of other things as part of our normal biological processes. So this, again, is fungal growth on the window frame. The window frame was aluminum. There's no organic material in aluminum and no organic material in paint. The fungal growth was growing on the dirt that was on the window frame. There'll be more pictures of that. This was my neighbor's house. 